This is mini lecture number 11, and it's your last mini lecture before the midterm, the first midterm, which covers night chapters one to four. In this mini lecture, I'm gonna cover night 4.5, which is a topic called centripetal acceleration. Centripetal means the acceleration towards the center. Now, before I do that though, I want to just point out how much we've covered and a, just a couple of sections you can omit. So we have covered in the last mini lecture, 4.4 and 4.6. However, in 4.6, I defined alpha is equal to d omega dt, the angular acceleration. So that means that I've covered 98 and 99, including the example at the top of page 100. However, I have not covered the section titled tangential acceleration, and I'm not going to, and that's one section that you're not responsible for. So tangential acceleration on page 100, don't worry about it. Similarly, there's only one other section. You can go all the way back to chapter two, You'll see that the very, very last section in chapter two was very similar. It was titled Instantaneous Acceleration, and you aren't responsible for this section titled Instantaneous Acceleration. So let's get on with what we're covering in this section, centripetal acceleration. So we have a particle going around in a circle. And of course, if a particle is going around in a circle of radius r, at any moment in time, it's going always perpendicularly at any moment to the radius vector that goes from the center of the circle to the edge of the circle. So when it's over here, it's going that way. And again, this is perpendicular. So if we take an angle, we call it the usual angle here, theta, and then we go to theta plus delta theta. So I'm gonna go add another angle here, delta theta. Then we can ask ourselves, well, what was the velocity here? And I'm trying to draw these the same length. This is uniform rotational motion same length, I'm trying to say, what is the difference between this, which might be v at time t, and this, which would be v at time t plus delta t. The new, what is the difference between this velocity and this velocity, during which time the particle has gone around delta theta? So if we're gonna, why would we do that? Well, because we wanna know the acceleration. And the acceleration, of course, if we make delta t sufficiently small or delta theta sufficiently small, the acceleration at time t is v at t plus delta t minus v at t over delta t. And these are vectors. Take the difference, divide by delta t. I haven't written it here, but take the limit, delta t goes to zero. And you've got the acceleration. Okay, so we need to do that little computation. And the way we do that computation is we bring the tails of these two vectors together. But first I'm gonna use the fact that, I will remind you of the fact that both of those are right angles. And these two vectors have the same length. And this angle that's shifted here is delta theta. So if I copy these two vectors over, v at t and v at t plus delta t, so here I'm copying over v at t, and here I'm copying over v at t plus delta t. If I do it nice and neatly, this is v at t, this is v at t plus delta t, 
And this angle delta theta here, because both of these are right angles, is the same as this angle delta theta here. Now I was running out of room, and I need to show you this derivation extremely carefully so that you really understand centripetal acceleration. So I'm recopying things over bigger. This is V at T. And this is V at T plus delta T. And notice these two vectors have the same length. But they differ in direction, we've already argued, by an amount delta theta. And we need to know V at T plus delta T minus V at T. And that vector is graphically represented by that. Now you can't do this problem quite exactly unless you introduce this bisector line that splits the difference between V at T and V at T plus delta T. And that bisector line, this angle would be delta theta over 2, and this angle would be delta theta over 2. And then we can now very clearly uh, ask exact questions about this vector that we've drawn right here. One thing we can say is that the direction of that vector is perpendicular to that bisector. And another thing we might really like to know is the length of that vector, which just for a moment here I'm going to call b. The length of that vector, you have to look at this diagram and go, well, how am I going to get that? Well, if you look carefully, you'll see that this little part right here, half of little b, b over 2, is equal to the sine of this angle times the length of the hypotenuse side. So b over 2 is equal to the sine of this little bisect their angle, which is sine of delta theta over 2, times the length of this side here, which is the hypotenuse side. That's the length of V. And I don't have to be specific about whether that's the length at V at T or the length at V at T plus delta T, because this whole thing is part of the problem of uniform circular motion. So, uh, the velocity, length of the velocity vector is unchanging even though its direction is changing. So there's our formula. B over 2 is sine of delta theta over 2 times the length of V. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is put in the actual definition of the average acceleration between time t and t plus delta t is equal to uh, this difference divided by delta t. And we've just figured out what the uh, length of this thing is. The length of this thing, b, is 2 sine delta theta over 2 times v. Now if you go, if you measure delta theta in radians, and you go to a tiny number of radians, so delta, remember, we're going to take the limit that delta t goes to zero. And if delta t goes to zero, then the amount of angle swept out by this particle is going to zero. So delta theta is also going to zero. So that means we can use an approximation here on this thing, which is only true when delta theta is tiny, and by the way, is only true when delta theta is in radians. And the approximation is that sine of an extremely small angle is the angle itself. So this thing right here, we're going to approximate as delta theta over 2. Okay. Well, that's nice because then the 2's cancel. And so what we're left with is delta theta over delta t times v. This is an approximation, but it's a good approximation in the limit that delta t goes to zero. And now let's take the limit that delta t goes to zero, 
This becomes, we can drop the average off the A, and this becomes A is equal to limit delta T goes to zero of delta theta over delta T times V, and that was the magnitude of A, and we already know the direction of A. The direction of A is perpendicular to this bisector line that was between V and V at T plus delta T. But in the limit that delta T goes to zero, that becomes the vector that's perpendicular to both this and this and that. Why? Because in the limit that delta T goes to zero, all those are squashing down to be the same direction. And uh, the length of V is a constant. So, and delta theta delta over delta t, we have a name for, that's omega. So we've just learned that the acceleration, the length of the acceleration is omega times uh, the velocity. But the velocity itself, we can also, the length of the velocity, we can also write as the radius times the rate of change of angle. So we've just learned that a is equal to r omega squared. Now, if you go look at night section 4.5, which is uniform circular motion and centripetal acceleration, you'll see this formula. But there's a bunch of other ways you can write this formula, okay? Because you can use things like, oh, well, I'm going to give a name to the length of V. I'm just going to call that V. And I'm going to go, oh, well, uh, I also know that that's equal to r omega. So here I have r omega squared, which is not quite what I want. If I write a, which is equal to the length of a, is equal to r omega squared, but then I would like to get it to look more like this, so I write it as r omega squared, but then I have to divide back out by 1r. Then you can see another one of Knight's formulas, which is that A is equal to V squared over R. And I think that gives you the uh, key formulas of centripetal acceleration. And remember, this is not something new. You already learned about in centripetal acceleration qualitatively when we were doing the airplane is turning to the west problem. While maintaining the same speed, so here's the airplane going north, here it's turning a little to the west, here it's turning a little more to the west, here it's turning a little more to the west. We already worked this qualitatively. Now I have been through some mathematics that allows you to quantitatively say how large that acceleration vector is. Okay, see you in class on Friday.